Uh, he is Christian Watkins. Please uh, join me in giving him a warm embrace. <laughs> Okay, I'd like to start this talk by asking everyone kindly to turn off their cell phones or any other device just for the remainder of this talk, if possible. So uh, when thinking of a talk for this conference, never done this before, I asked God what he wanted me to talk about. And one thing that really spoke to my heart was just the lack of silence that we have in our world today. All around us, there's so much noise, whether from the television screen, from the news, from our phones, from our friends, from everything. There's just so much noise that just surrounds us and leaves us empty and hoping and wishing for something more. But, uh, and I'd like to say before I go too deep into this talk that I'm no better than anyone else here in this room. When I was preparing this talk, actually, it was so hard for me that instead of praying and asking God for help, I had to check how Stephen Curry and his daughters were doing and how well they could sing in the car. And I don't know if you guys don't know who Stephen Curry is. That would be kind of sad, but he just won the finals. Um, so I'm no better at this than anyone else. But I don't, there's another common story that I'd like to tell you. And either if you're a parent or a kid, it's the story of trying to convince your parent or your kid trying to convince you to get them a phone. And you might hear stuff like, I need it to talk with friends. I need it to be in community. I need, I need this phone so that I can be someone. Everyone has one. Please, please give it to me. And the only reason that I thought of this is because my little brother is doing the same thing right now. And I thought it was funny because the one friend that he wanted to talk to and he said that he needed this phone for didn't even have a phone. And when I offered to give him my phone to contact this friend, that simply was not good enough. I mean, that wouldn't work and was off the table. So the sad thing is, when we finally do get this phone, if our parents cave in or we cave in to our children, I don't have kids, but some of you guys do, um, all that does is bring us further apart from ourselves and further apart from God. I've just been finishing up school, high school, just graduated. And for one assignment, I had to take or I had to watch a TED Talk. And I really like TED Talks, except the pagan ones uh, where they just talk about horrible stuff. But this particular TED Talk I especially liked. It was from a psychologist named Sherry Turk. And she was it was, the talk was titled Connected But Alone. And one thing she said really hit me, that technology nowadays is not only changing what we do, but who we are. And I personally can testify to this reality firsthand. Uh, when I was growing up, there wasn't a lot of technology in the home. We had one of those brick TVs and VHS player. And I don't know, I only remember those days with fond memories, but grandma's was totally different. Grandma, she had about three iPads. The TV was always on, whether it be the news, sports, some movie, um, it didn't matter, the TV was always on, the iPads were always accessible, and I loved that. Whenever I would go over to grandma's, it wasn't to hang out with grandma, it was to hang out with the iPad. It was to watch the TV. I didn't want to hang out with grandma so much as play with her things. And so, one Christmas, I saw what I considered an abandoned iPad, and somehow, I convinced my dad to let me take it home. And so from that day on, the most, I would say one of the most important things to me about life was being able to watch YouTube, was being able to check out into that iPad. I remember we were in a bunk bed, me and my brother, and I would every night go under the covers, pull out my iPad, start watching videos till about 2 a.m., put the iPad as far away as I could so it looked like I had never been using it, and then try to go to sleep. And from an iPad, it went to an iPod, then an Xbox, and all these other techno technology devices. And not even slowly, but surely, but almost right away, silence was eradicated from my life. All I wanted to live for and do 
was to check out into noise. Life became way too hard for me. And the only thing that I loved, or I thought that I loved, was watching these things, was going onto YouTube and watching Minecraft or something like that. And the only, the only thing that I was missing, or I thought that I was missing, was a phone. Around this time, I was in seventh grade. We had just moved. It was a hard move. And this was the time when everyone was getting their phones. And this was a life or death situation for me. I needed a phone. I thought, without a phone, I can't live. I can't make friends. I can't do anything without a phone. And so I went on a mission to convince my parents of this same fact. They, 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 heard, my, they heard what I had to say, so my parents are smarter than they look, and they decided to get me a flick phone. But no, oh, this wouldn't work for me. So I remember one day, it was the first day, I had tried to bike home alone from school, and my parents printed me up a MapQuest and made sure that I knew where I was going. And I came back home from school and I took a wrong turn. And I think that I rode my bike for about three hours in the wrong direction, just hoping that I would get home. And I ended up in an entirely new city. But I used this situation to explain to my parents the necessity of a real phone, one with GPS, one that would never get me lost. And I remember having this really intense conversation where I explained how, well, I truly believed that this phone was gonna bring me everything that I wanted. That this truly was a life or death situation for me. That my parents were blocking me from true happiness, from true love and true peace by restricting me from getting a phone. And, and parents, I'd like to warn you, at all costs, don't get your kid a phone. Don't get your kid a phone. It's not worth it. It's not worth it. It's too hard. Even if you have a pure heart and you want to go towards God, if, you're, if you get stuck with a phone, it's impossible. There's too many great things on the phone. It's too hard. And so uh, I tried convincing, saying I needed friends. And my mom would never have it. She never wanted me to have a phone. But my dad had a little soft spot, and I pressured that soft spot, and I ended up getting a phone. And through that phone, I became increasingly more and more anxious, more and more depressed. All the friends that I had just turned into bad friends. I couldn't communicate with anybody. Last time, when I told my testimony two days ago, I told you that that friend had abandoned me in middle school. Well, after that, I really, really shut down. I couldn't. I began to make myself sick just so that I didn't have to go to school and just so that I could continue to watch videos. I made myself sick. I gave myself a headache. I have no idea how I did this, but somehow I did. And so this is where I was at with the phone. I couldn't think of anything else besides going back to my safe place, my refuge, my salvation was that phone, was YouTube, was Netflix, was Snapchat, anything to get me out of this world. And so this was my life from seventh grade to the middle of sophomore year and beyond. I couldn't handle life without some form of noise, some form of something to get me away from my problems. And social media was no help. I began, I, I didn't really like Instagram or any other social media, but Snapchat was big for me. And every time I went on Snapchat, I felt miserable because I saw how everyone else seemed happy, but not me. How everyone else had a bunch of friends to hang out with and to laugh with, but not me. And I was constantly sad over the fact that I didn't get as many notifications as I saw that my friends did. And I was just miserable. I began to hate life, I began to hate myself, I began to hate my family, I began to hate everything. I couldn't stand one moment in silence. I couldn't, it would make me cringe. I remember one time my parents took away my phone and my iPad and all this technology and I rummaged through the cabinets and I looked for a radio and I plugged the radio in just so that I could listen to music to drown out the silence. Because I couldn't handle it. I couldn't handle an ounce. And so this was my struggle. And YouTube was the worst. I would watch at least five hours a day of YouTube every day after school, far into the night. 
this is where I was. And YouTube led to watching other worse videos, worse content. And then I had my conversion. And then I met God. And for a moment, there was silence in my life. For a moment, I had a thought. For a moment, I was able to think of something different than the noise. But that was my biggest struggle after my conversion because it was God's silence or the world's noise. There was no lukewarmness about it. It was all or nothing for me. There was no way I could make, I could make both things work in my life. And this is when one of the biggest battles of my life started. I knew the only way, I was so addicted to technology that the only way I could stop, the only way that I could let go was to quit everything, to let everything go, to throw it all away, to delete my social media accounts, to delete YouTube, to block any access from these things. And there would be weeks when I was doing well. I didn't look at anything. I didn't go on YouTube. I didn't go on social media. But then there would be weeks when I just caved in and collapsed on myself. When I would not even go out of my room, I wouldn't take a shower. I began to get acne and I would scratch my face because I was so addicted to this noise. Because it was such an intense struggle between God and the world. And so this, is the, this was the intense struggle that it took to separate myself from noise and into silence, into peace, and into God's love. And it took a long time. And it's still a daily struggle because I can't let myself go back because it's too easy to fall. But I succeeded through the grace of God. I was able to let go of all social media, to stop watching YouTube, to stop playing video games. And in and through all this, I began to learn to love God. And I truly began to fall in love with God. And there was no more noise to distract me from what I truly desired, from what I truly wanted, which was God, which was love, which was rest. And I spent time in silence and in prayer. I would spend long hours in adoration. And I would go to daily mass. And it was a beautiful time. And I even met a wonderful friend, one that was far different than any other friend I had had because this was a friend from God. This was a friend that God had given me, a friend that loved God almost or just as much as I did. And I was given a gift of deep, deep peace within my soul. But I'd like to explain this friend a little more. We became more than best friends, more than close. I loved him and he loved me. We were both discerning the priesthood together and he had, I don't know, a gazillion spiritual gifts that I thought awe-inspiring. And I was so inspired by him and I thought that he was already a saint and we would be friends forever. We would always be close. We would always be connected. And then he abandoned me again. This was a different feeling than the first abandonment in middle school because this was a God friend. This was someone who was more than a friend. This was a brother. This is someone who we had taken into our home after he was such a spiritual warrior. He had been living in a tent and one night there was a storm and his tent fell down and we took him into our own home and he lived with us for months. And we would talk for hours about Jesus. We would talk for hours about that love of God and nothing else. There was nothing else we desired. And he left me. He left me completely. And I had no idea what to do. And I developed a severe eating problem after this. We didn't know it was depression at the time, but I became so depressed that instead of it attacking my mind, it went straight into my body. And I would have to eat every two hours just to be able to think of anything. Everything became hard. Everything became, uh, I don't know, was it crazy. <laughs> Everything became horrible in my eyes. Of course, God was still there, but I didn't feel like it. And through this time, I really struggled. And I remember 
the day that his mother texted me and said that he was back in town and he wasn't doing well and that basically she wanted us to save him. And by this point, I wanted nothing to do with him because he had hurt me so bad. But for love of God and for what I thought was love of him, I decided to go. And I remember meeting him. He was not doing well and he tried to pretend that everything was still cool with him and God, but it just felt fake and phony and so difficult. But we took him home and I remember I wanted to show him that he was still loved no matter what. I didn't love him because he loved God. I loved him because he was my brother, my friend. And we went on a long walk and he told me how much he hated God, how much he didn't want anything to do with God and how miserable he was and how he wanted to be miserable, that this was all he wanted, that he wanted to live a life of sin, not too much sin, but it broke my heart. It was the hardest walk, the hardest talk I've ever had. Actually, the second hardest talk I ever had. And this is where we were at. And when he left after that weekend, I thought he would never come back again, but somehow he came back into my life and he would do these different things where he would show up and he would say that he wanted to change but it was all for naught. It was all for crap. He didn't want to do anything. He still wanted to be the same. And he would always do these horrible things to me. I remember one time I drove for two hours to come pick him up and take him home to our home. And when I arrived there, he wouldn't answer his phone. He wouldn't answer his texts until about five hours later when he said that he had just gotten wasted and drunk and he had passed out and he didn't mean what he did, and that he didn't even know that I was coming to pick him up. He thought that I was just coming to hang out with him, that I was just coming as a friend. You have no idea how much pain, how much hurt, how much hatred there was in my heart. I was so close to slamming the door on this relationship, but God, put his finger there. And after that, he came back to the house and after a few days, he seemed to have a genuine conversion. He told me that he had been smoking more than smoking in our house. He had been smoking so much that he smoked four carts, THC carts, which more, normally you go through in a week if you're an intense smoker. He had gone through four of them in two days at our house. And I thought, Thank God, it's all been worth it. All my suffering, all my sacrifice for this guy, all my prayers, finally it's gonna be back to normal. Finally, we're gonna start talking about God again, talking about his love, talking about his mercy. But that wasn't it. After that, he became more of a jerk to me. By what he would say, what he would do, how he would act. I remember one time I was sitting, having a really hard day. I was still struggling with this food problem. We had gone to doctors. We had tried to figure out what was wrong with my health because it couldn't have possibly been depression. And there was nothing, we couldn't figure it, figure it out. We had done thousands of tests, not thousands. I mean, that's a lot of tests. We've done, we did a lot of tests to see what was wrong with me and we couldn't figure it out. And I was just struggling that day. And he came over in his gruff tone of voice. We had asked him to do something. And he would never do anything. If we asked him to just clean the kitchen, he would clean a little bit and then go into his room. And he was living there rent-free. All we did was try to love him and give him support. And he wouldn't even clean the kitchen. And I remember we, asked, we had asked him to do something. And he was not having it this day. And he lashed out at me and I took everything. I took every sharp word, glance, everything that he had said literally tore my heart apart because this was right after he had some supposed conversion where he had felt the love of God again. He just ripped my heart again. And instead of thinking, 
wow, he's just messed up. I somehow turned it in on myself and said that I wasn't following God's will and that's why he was so mean and angry to me. So I spent about a half a year struggling through this, through these feelings, through these attacks and stuff built up, resentment built up, hatred built up in my heart. And I knew that I was going to explode if I didn't let him know how I felt and let him know how much he hurt me. Because I would say to him, don't you know you're doing this? And he would say, yes, and I'm sorry. But then he would do the same thing the next day. It seemed like he didn't care a wint about who I was and who I was to him. And so after considering it with my mom, I realized, well, and the food problem was just getting increasingly worse and worse during this time. And during a conversation with my mom, she asked me if I thought that I might have depression. And for the first time, I allowed myself to feel that, to feel that depression. And immediately, all that food problem and all that pain went and set up from my body right into my brain and into my mind. And I became more than depressed, or what I would call more than depressed, and began the hardest period of my life or continued the hardest period of my life. And I remember we had scheduled a day to talk to this friend about my feelings and what he had done to me and how it affected me. And I was so anxious, so nervous that I was yelling. I, comedy is my uh, stress reliever my nervous mechanism. And so I was just joking and yelling and laughing in the car all the way to this talk that we had set up with my mom and a friend of ours. And when I arrived there, I didn't want to get out of the car. And I could barely go up to the front door. And when I went to the front door, I learned that he wasn't ready for the talk. And they had tried to cancel the talk, which made me even more just desperate and hurting and alone. And I remember going into a corner and collapsing on the floor and wanting to curl up in a fetal position because of how horrible I felt, because of how lonely and sad and hard this was for me through the grace of God, through my mother and this friend, I was able to have this conversation. I told him how, not without crying, but I had told him how this was a deep wound for me, how it wasn't just him that this had happened to, but it had been in middle school and in high school, and now it had been with him. And how I was so traumatized by him that I couldn't, hand this, I couldn't handle the sound of his footsteps near my door. I couldn't stand the sight of eye contact with him in the face. I told him all this, and it was the hardest thing I've ever done in my life. And afterwards, I learned from our friend, or afterwards, our friend that had helped set this conversation up, she smelled roses. And roses are a sign of the Blessed Mother. If you ever smell roses and there's no roses around, it's Our Lady, it's our mom. And I knew that our mother had been with me, my mother, my mother Mary had been with me during that, con during that conversation. And I learned later that that friend had also seen the Holy Spirit around me during that talk, like she had never seen before. And I knew that God was also with me during that talk. And after that talk, I set up boundaries and there was room for silence. There was room for silence in my life again. I hadn't abandoned God this time. But everything was so hard and so difficult. Every breath was a struggle that I had no time, or I thought that I had no time for silence. And I began to see my own problems and my own struggles in this situation. I saw how much hatred and resentment I had in my heart. And I didn't like it. 
I saw how I had been trying to please God with scruples, how every act I did, I judged myself and didn't let myself go for the littlest thing. And I realized that this was making me miserable. And I really, during this time, sunk into deeper depression. And I wasn't able to get out. I barely wanted to wake up in the morning. I remember some Sundays barely wanting to go to Mass because it was too hard, way too hard for me. Everything was too hard for me. And so during this time of silence, instead of going back to the noise that I had once gone back to, I fought myself daily not to go back into YouTube, into social media, into anything to drown the problems. And I worked on forgiving this friend. And I confessed my hatred, and I confessed my lack of forgiveness, and I confessed my scruples, and I fought with my own demons through the silence, through prayer, through adoration. And it was very hard. But I won, or God won through me. And through it all, I finally learned the greatest commandment. Matthew chapter 37, verses 37 through 40, or Matthew verses 37 through 40. Love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul and with all your mind. This is the first and greatest commandment. And the second is like it. Love your neighbor as yourself. All the law and the prophets hang on these two commandments. I had the first commandment, but I didn't have the second. I didn't love myself. And because I didn't love myself, it was hard for me to love my neighbor, especially when they had hurt me so bad. But through this, this trial, this testing period, through this desert, just like Jesus went to the desert to be tempted by the devil, and then afterwards began his public ministry. I was put into the desert by God in order to be tested, in order to be refined, to be molded into who he wanted me to be, a little more like God, a little closer to heaven. And I finally learned to love myself. And guys, this is recent. This is like a week ago. For the first day, I told my mom how much I loved myself, how happy I was that I loved God, how happy I was that I was where I was at. And again, that peace filled my soul. And I'm still struggling to this day with certain things. Life's a journey, it's a step. But I can truly say that through the silence, I learned to love God. And I learned that God loved me. And I learned to listen to his voice, a still and a small whisper. And I'd like to give you a quote from Mother Teresa. In the silence of the heart, God speaks. If you face God in prayer and silence, God will speak to you. Then you will know that you are nothing. It is only when you realize your nothingness, your emptiness, that God can fill you with himself. Souls of prayer are souls of great silence. So what I'd like to leave you with is a call to silence, a call to ask yourself, do I like where I'm at right now in life? Am I happy? Do I know that God loves me? Do I need to work on anything in life? Because we all need to work on something. But God is in the silence. We have to make room for silence, room for prayer, room for contemplation. It doesn't just come. You're not going to pray any better if you keep the same habit of watching TV every night. You're not going to make room for silence if you don't turn off your phone or delete certain social media apps that you don't need. We have to make room for silence, room for prayer, and room for, God, or in room for God, or we'll lose him. And we don't wanna lose him. Amen. Are we good on time? How, many, how much? One second. Um, if we still have time, what we were going to have my mom do is lead us in some silent prayer, but we do. So I'd like to invite my mom up to lead us. Or 
I would like to lead you guys in some silent prayer. So could we dim the lights? Is that possible? Would it be possible to dim the lights? Oh, now I'll have my mom lead you in silent prayer. Can we dim the lights? I know how to dim the lights. Can I have all of you close your eyes? We're going to do something that's uncomfortable for a lot of us in our noisy world. We're going to go into silence, just five minutes of silence. But it's going to seem like an eternity if we're used to noise. I'm going to ask the Holy Spirit to give me words to guide you. I don't know what I'm going to say yet. But call on the Holy Spirit with me, and please close your eyes. Come, Holy Spirit. Come, Holy Spirit. Come fill the hearts of your faithful. In the silence, ask God this question. Do you love me? In the silence, listen for his response. Ask the Lord, do you have a word of encouragement for me? I need to hear from you now. Ask him, Lord, is there something that you're asking me to give up and let go of that I'm so attached to? And yet I know in my guilt, in my secrecy, or in the ways I use it as a distraction, that you're asking me to stop, but I don't want to. Tell the Lord what hurts you the most. Tell him now about your deepest pain. Cry out from the depths of your soul and say to him, I need you. I need you. Now and forever. Don't leave me, not for a second.
I'm sensing the Lord wanting to say, I've never left you. Not for one second. I'm closer to you than you are to yourself. I live and breathe within you. I know your every thought. I feel your feelings with you. How could I abandon you if I live within you? It's you at times who have abandoned me. I am incapable of abandoning you. I love you too much. Will you spend more time in silence with me? Can you feel, can you hear how rich the silence is with my heart beating in time with yours. Let me be the love of your life. I died for you. In the silence, tell him any last words that you wish to. Now slowly bring your awareness into the present moment and open your eyes. Come to me, says the Lord. Come to me in the silence. So that was just five minutes of our lives. And for some reason, it can be so hard to give God just five minutes of silence. And yet how rich it can be.